Good evening, everyone. This is the InfoWars Nightly News. It is Friday, the 13th of July, 2012. And here's a quick look at what we have lined up for you this evening. Tonight, Darren McBreen interviews Dr. Mary's monkey author, Edward T. Haslam, about the JFK assassination's link to emerging global epidemics. Plus, free sterilization for all fertile women under Obamacare. Then, a woman decides to grope the TSA in self-defense and finds herself charged with battery. All that and more on the InfoWars Nightly News. All that and more coming up during the next hour. But first, we begin with a false flag alert for a pretext of war with Syria. As nameless U.S. officials have told the Wall Street Journal that the Syrian government is taking chemical weapons out of storage for possible use against anti-regime rebels or civilians, possibly in an ethnic cleansing campaign. It also states that they are most worried about Syria's stockpiles of sarin gas. So here we go again. It's already been documented that NATO's hired militant groups like Al-Qaeda, or Al-Qaeda, are already carrying out a deadly nationwide terrorist bombing campaign, you know, killing innocent civilians. And it's also been confirmed by governments and international media on numerous occasions, so spare me the BS comments and look it up yourself. So, uh, you know, this is all looking way too familiar. You know, we've been expecting this some, for some time. You know, Syria has been on the hit list for some time, like PNAC, the Project for a New American Century. Uh, Syria has been on their hit list. And no doubt that the globalists would prefer that the Obama administration continue the Bush doctrine. And that's exactly what they're doing. So, uh, and, you know, with the help of, of NATO, which is now in control of uh, Congress and the Senate, uh, when it comes to policing the world. So, and in the Syrian government, they're not going to use chemical weapons. If that happens, it was a false flag attack carried out by NATO. All right, now up next, we have an update on the woman who took action against the TSA after being groped and felt up and molested by the evasive pat down. Uh, you may recall she voiced her complaint to a TSA supervisor. And she proceeded to physically demonstrate how she was groped. The incident captured there on security cam. She basically started doing to the TSA what they had done to her. That only sounds fair. I mean, give them a taste of their own medicine. And her actions were mild in comparison to, you know, what the TSA agents routinely inflict on the traveling public. You know, grope downs that include physically grabbing your genitals, grabbing, you know, touching kids. Uh, we've all seen it. We've heard the stories. But um, And how did the TSA respond to someone touching them? Well, they claim that Carol Price carried out an act of violence. That's right, only in America. I mean, you know, remember, she got groped first. They physically put their hand down her bra. They put their hands up and down her breast. They went up and down her legs, you know, they touched her junk. And, um, but you know, we're supposed to accept that. Meanwhile, Carol Price has been found guilty of battery for conducting what thousands of Americans are subjected to every single day, you know, a TSA style pat down. The jury, probably anxious to get back home and, you know, watch American Idol, they only took 20 minutes to deliver a verdict. So Price is now on probation for the next six months. She was issued a $500 fine. So I guess the TSA has some kind of divine power that makes them immune to carrying out sexual assaults against the public. I, I don't know what else to say. All right. Hey, um, yesterday, one of our top stories on Infowars.com was the coverage of a, a viral video that's on YouTube right now. And this is where a man refuses to comply with internal checkpoints. You know, Border Patrol agents, you know, they set up a network of unconstitutional checkpoints all over the United States. 
And in this video clip, informed citizen Stephen Anderson gives a sterling example of how to stand up for your rights and teach the cops a thing or two at the same time. That's, that's always fun. So uh, score one for the Fourth Amendment. Let's take a look. What's up, man? How are you doing today, sir? Good. You a uh, citizen? That's my business. Well, it's our business to ask. Are you a citizen or no? You can ask. That's fine. And you have to answer me, or I'll mm -hmm. have to detain you until you can either tell me that you're a uh, Well, I don't have to answer you because I have uh, rights as an American. Sir, go ahead and pull over there or behind that other vehicle if you do me a favor. Nah, no, thanks. I'd like to just go on my way. You, you can go on your way as soon as you tell mm -hmm. me if you're a U.S. citizen. Well, you know, I, I didn't know that I have to go around proving that I'm a citizen. Do I need to, like, show my papers, like yeah, the Nazis? So this or immigration I'm not, am I immigrating somewhere? Or negative, but we're supposed to check on is this Mexico or? The United States. Huh? Just answer the question, yes or no. Well, well, let me ask you this. You know, is this Nazi Germany now? I have to show my papers? yes or no. You can either answer it or we can detain you here until we figure mm -hmm. out whether you're a U.S. citizen. Well, you know what's what's more simple is the fact that my freedom is a little more important than you seem to think. And that, you know, setting up checkpoints where people have to prove that they're a citizen is not something that America is supposed to be about. So, I'm not sure if you understand that. Huh? No. Huh? He doesn't want to tell me a citizen. Well, I'm just, I mean, I'm just driving down the road here and I've been stopped for some reason and I'm, you know, you supposed to, uh, no thank you. I want you to pull up secondary, sir. No thanks. I want, I want to go free on my way. Okay. I'm, you know, here I am just going about my own business and, you know, I don't need to stop at a checkpoint where I have to prove who I am because this is America. Okay. You know, I, I, correct me if I'm wrong, did I stumble into Mexico or is it still United States? So okay, well then therefore I should have the freedom to travel unmolested because okay. I'm in America here. Okay. So, go, go ahead, go. Go, go ahead, ahead and go, go where? Keep going on the road. Okay, see you later. You know, if more people would just follow that example by simply standing up for their rights and refusing to obey unconstitutional demands, freedom might still be salvaged in this country. And we are joined now by the star of the video, Pastor Stephen Anderson, joins us from my hometown, Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, Stephen Anderson, it's good to have you on the show today. Yeah, it's good to be here. Thanks for having me. So tell us a little bit more about what happened that day. You know, those officers, they looked a little bit shocked and surprised when, uh, when you refused their orders. Uh, what went down? Well, I was on my way to work in California, and I ended up going through three checkpoints within about 90 minutes. The first checkpoint was the agricultural inspection, which I didn't get that on video, unfortunately, but they wanted to search the trunk of my car. I told them I wasn't a commercial vehicle. I wasn't hauling any produce, but they tried to insist on searching my car. Finally, they let me go after a few minutes, and then I showed up at the second checkpoint where the video starts, and uh, they asked me if I was a citizen. And, you know, I've been going through these checkpoints for years. I never answer any of their questions because, uh, frankly, I don't feel like I should have to. I'm just traveling around doing my own business. I shouldn't have to uh, be stopped and interrogated at these things. And then the third checkpoint I went to, they just instantly, they didn't even ask me if I was a citizen. They just instantly said, go to secondary so that your car can be inspected. And they were just planning on searching my vehicle. So I think the reason why they look so shocked that I'm telling them no is that thousands of people are going through these things every day, and I think very few people are telling them no. I think everybody just goes along with it. I don't. Maybe they're afraid to stand up to them, or maybe they just don't understand how serious this is. They might think it's just a really minor inconvenience, but the scary part is what where this is going. You know, it might seem small now, a small inconvenience. But these checkpoints are the infrastructure being set up for even more invasive checkpoints that are going to be used in the future. They're just getting us used to it, getting us acclimated to it. Well, it's getting ridiculous. And, you know, even the, uh, the border patrols in California, for example, where you were stopped, they are set up miles and miles away from the actual border. 
Um, you know, even in San Bernardino County, I've even heard reports where actual military are on the street to assist in uh, DUI uh, checkpoints. And uh, here in Texas, you know, even Alex Jones, we've got a video where Alex was stopped 100 miles from the border of Mexico where he was stopped. And the Border Patrol, they wanted to uh, board the vehicle, and he kind of had the same reaction that, that you had, and, and that video is available on the uh, Internet. And now we've even got, you know, the TSA has even announced that they're going to expand their Viper program. It's going to include... Uh, train stations, bus terminals, and even roadside checkpoints of commercial vehicles. So this is obviously spreading out of control, don't you think? Absolutely. And, and it's like you said, it's all part of a larger system that includes the TSA. It includes DUI checkpoints, narcotics checkpoints, border patrol checkpoints. It doesn't matter what the excuse is. These checkpoints are, are setting up an infrastructure to control the American people and to slowly take away our liberties. And so regardless of what people's view are, uh, what, what their view is of the, of the border security issue or of illegal immigration, that's not the point. The point is that these checkpoints are unconstitutional, they're a violation of our natural rights, and something's wrong when you're going through three of them within 90 minutes of just driving westbound on I-8. I mean, that's pretty extreme. No, it's almost, and, it reminds me of not only uh, an inconvenience, but it's also conditioning. It's almost like they're conditioning us to go through these random stops and kind of get used to it. Before you joined us, we showed the first half of the video uh, where you went through, you finally managed to get through the, the first checkpoint. Now we're quickly going to take a look at uh, checkpoint number two. Let's take a look. This one a little bit, considering... Uh, yeah. Yeah. No. No, thank you. No. You know, I don't know why you've held me up in this traffic jam for the last 20 minutes. This is the third checkpoint I've been through in the last couple hours. No, thank you. I, I'd like to go free on my way, please. Hey, get a soup. What's up, man? What's up? All right. Can we have you uh, pull in secondary, please? No, thank you. I'd like to go free on my way. Uh, and why? Why are you? Free? Why don't you want to go secondary? Um, maybe it's because I've just sat in traffic for the last 20 minutes, and I'm already running late, and I don't have time to stop at your Nazi checkpoint and show my papers today. You know, I thought this is America. I thought I had some freedom right. to travel unmolested, and I'm just trying to go about my business here. You know, I don't have time to play games with you guys. <laughs> you know, I don't know what I don't know what you think you're doing here. All right, stopping me, me for no reason. Hey, Heather, can you run this car really quick? You know, you stopped me for no reason. I've waited in traffic for the last 20, 30 minutes that you guys created this traffic jam. I got places to go. I, I have to go make an honest living. All right, hold on. You know, and you guys want to screw around with me. All right, man. All right. Well, as sad as it is to see America finally getting to this point, it's also encouraging to see patriotic individuals like yourself, you know, standing up to these thugs. And um, I wanted to ask you about your, your camera setup. I noticed you had, you had your camera set up there on the passenger side. What kind of camera did you use? How did you mount it? And the reason why I ask, I think it, it would be a good idea for more citizens to kind of do the same thing for their own protection as they, uh, you know, are, go against these guys. Right. Well, the good news is there's nothing fancy about my setup. It was just a basic JVC camcorder, just a little typical handy cam like anybody would, would pick up at the electronics store. And, you know, my fancy mount was basically I just had a sweater sitting on the passenger seat and I just kind of bunched up the sweater to get the right angle. Well, that's good. So, that's right. good. <laughs> I don't really have a fancy camera mount or anything. I just like to carry a camera everywhere I go because... You know, I want to document this stuff because of the fact that there are a lot of people who live in other parts of the country and they might hear about something like this and think it's exaggerated and it doesn't really hit home with them until they actually see what these checkpoints are like. So that's why I like to video it and put it online. And I'm hoping that people will see what I did and do the exact same thing. Because even if just a small percentage of people acted the way that I do when I go through these checkpoints, I think it would back them down. Yeah, and when you post them on YouTube, it catches on. People kind of see how, how they could react to a similar situation. And, 
Do you, now you're a pastor there in, in Tempe, do you discuss this in church at all? Uh, you know, do you tell people at church what happened and what you went through? I do. It's, it's not a huge emphasis of my ministry. Obviously, I focus mostly on preaching the Bible and on spiritual things, but definitely before and after the services, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about stuff like this. And I've, I've gone into it from the pulpit as well when it was applicable to the part of the Bible that I was preaching. Sure. But most of the people at my church are, are, are pretty up on these type of things. They're, they're pretty smart people. And so... You know, I enjoy talking to them about it because they understand exactly what I'm talking about. Well, if I still lived in Phoenix, I would I'd probably definitely uh, be going to your church. So, uh, hey, let me ask you this. Uh, before we go, what is your message to police and military who might be watching this right now? How do you explain to them that what they're doing is wrong and how do we get them to join the, uh, the good side? Well, I guess they just need to read a history book would probably be where they need to start because that's that's really... When I started waking up to these things back in around 2008 um, with the Ron Paul campaign and just a lot of things that kind of got my attention, you know, I started doing a lot of reading of history. And I think that the problem is people just don't know history, so they don't realize that these checkpoints are just the beginning. And they're very naive to think that it's just going to stop with what's going on with the TSA at the airport, these checkpoints. They don't realize that this is just the beginning of a program uh, of total enslavement and a totalitarian government. And then I also have a message for, for Christians who, who uh, basically look at something like this and say that we shouldn't be fighting this battle. You know, I don't see how you can be a Bible-believing Christian and not understand that the Bible clearly says that there's going to be a one-world government, that there's going to be a mark of the beast in people's right hand and in their forehead. And these checkpoints are just a setting up of that police state that's going to make that possible to uh, to control people and, and make sure that they, you know, bow down and worship the Antichrist and what have you. Well, well said. And, uh, you know, thank you for joining us. You know, keep that camera rolling because I'm sure there will be other incidences. This isn't your, your first uh, incident. I know you've uh, ran into, you've actually got tased. Tell us about the time you got tased because weren't you on the Alex Jones show before because of another incident? Right. That was back in 2009. And I've gone through there hundreds of times without complying. I haven't got them all on video. Some of them just weren't that interesting, so I didn't upload them. But the time in 2009, you know, they would not take no for an answer. And after about an hour and a half of a standoff, they ended up busting out my windows, tasering me for 22 seconds and uh, shoving my face in broken glass. I ended up in the hospital having to get stitches in my head and uh, spent the night in jail, but later a jury found me not guilty on all charges, and now we're taking them to court in a federal lawsuit. So hopefully we'll have an update on that by the end of the year. That's a pretty slow process, but it, I'm looking forward to that. Sure, sure. We'll keep us updated on that as well, and obviously you're not too intimidated because you're still standing up to these guys. Thanks for joining us. Keep that camera rolling. Uh, the next incident, we'll be looking out for it. Sounds good. Thanks. All right, bud. Thank you. All right. All right, we're going to continue with some Obamacare news. Hey, did you know that sterilization will not cost women a penny under Obamacare? That's right. A new regulation that goes into effect on August 1st requires that health plans cover sterilization for all women with reproductive capacity. How much you want to make a bet that that includes teenage girls? Well, guess what? It does include teenage girls. Uh, it's, it's true. Maybe uh, Texas Governor Rick Perry will make it mandatory. I, I don't know. So, uh, you know, just like that stunt he pulled with the dangerous Gardasil shot, who knows? But, uh, of course, the sterilization mandate will make health insurance more expensive for all of us. But the social engineers in Washington, D.C. love it because they love death. And they want you to think that they are saving the planet by reproducing, or excuse me, by reducing human population. So, uh, you know, welcome to Agenda 21, making the world a more sustainable place in the 21st century. Now, up next, I've been looking forward to this one because we have a new video from Luke Rudowski from We Are Change as he confronts Newt Gingrich again about his attendance at the Bohemian Grove. And this time, Luke brought proof of Newt's attendance. Let's check it out. Can I get a quick autograph here? What's this picture of? 
I actually don't remember. Let's see you at the Bohemian Grove. Okay. You told me that oh, yeah. uh, I'm delusional. You know, it's nice to know that there's some people who have fantasy lives. It's not that have nothing it's to touch with. Nice to, nice to have you here. Bye-bye. So you were there. Can we talk to you about it, sir? No questions at all? Any questions, any answers on the Bohemian Grove? You never no. want to talk to me about it. I'm not going to stop asking the question. Who do you think that uh, might be a good person to consider for a uh, VP? When are you going to open up on the Bohemian Grove? Bye bye. You might as well just answer the question. It's going to be a lot easier. People are just going to—it's going to be on YouTube. People are just going to speculate that there's something wrong unless you tell us there's nothing wrong. Come on. Come on. There's a step I'm for just life. trying to be transparent and open. That's all I'm trying to do, Neil. And you're kind of making yourself look kind of guilty. Come on. Is that, there's an elephant in the room behind him. <laughs> what the heck? We thought, you know, it looks like there's not a lot of people here. We could at least, you know, have a conversation. You know, talk to you. That's okay. You know what? Uh, we just want to end all the speculation and theories. We, we want to end that. Goodbye, but sir. by not answering, you kind of make you. it look Goodbye. bad. Thank you very much. It's just a question. I understand. Oh, thank I'm you. Not, I'm not in you know. Thank you. I, I try. I, you know, like we don't know what's happening at the Bohemian Grove. There's all these theories out there. The only way to get the truth is to go to somebody and to ask them the question. But when they don't answer the question, it's kind of sad. And I uh, just, <laughs> I just noticed my favorite graphic right there, Marcos. Thank you very much. That is one of my all-time favorites. You know, I was watching that, and I was wondering if if Newt ever told his Stepford wife, you know, tales, adventures of the Bohemian Grove. I wonder if she found out or if she knows about, you know, because she obviously can't go. It's it's males only because they like to walk around naked in the woods together and then dress up in black robes and worship the. Moloch God. So how creepy is that? Once again, proving that truth is definitely stranger than fiction. And uh, oh, that's the graphic. Okay, I found, I was doing so, some Bohemian Grove research today, and I found this on a website called truthertoys.com. Now, is that cool or what? That is a Bohemian Grove set. <laughs> And I got to have one of those. They even have an Alex Jones bobblehead. Could you show one of those? And, uh, okay, this is satire. I've just been told that this is satire. That's too bad because, well, if it was real, we'd all have these by now. So, and, um, well, how, <laughs> that is cool. Hey, while we're on the subject of Bohemian Grove, you know that George Bush Sr. and, and George W., uh, they were regular uh, attendees. And uh, so they like to dress up in the robes and worship Moloch as well. But not everybody who attended Bohemian Grove liked it. And that brings us to our quote of the day. And this one from Tricky Dick. As he says, Bohemian Grove that I attend from time to time is the most faggy, gd thing you could ever imagine. And that was an elegant quote by... Richard Nixon apologized for the uh, foul language in that one, but he actually said that. And you can actually, somewhere you can find the audio recording. I've, I've heard it before. It actually goes on after that, talking about not wanting to shake hands with people from San Francisco, and it's whacked, man. Uh, you got to check it out. Hey, we're going to take a quick break, but when we come back, we're going to, um, well, Aaron Dykes has a special report. So when we go to break, we're going to throw to this, and this is about a U.N. gun control uh, Aaron Dykes, uh, I just found out about this just now. After that, we go to break, and then when we come back, we're going to have Ed Haslam in studio, and he is the author of Dr. Mary's Monkey, right here. And it's about the unsolved murder of a doctor, a secret laboratory in New Orleans, and cancer-causing monkey viruses that are linked to Lee Harvey Oswald, the JFK assassination, and emerging global epidemics. Ed Haslam, when we come back, but first, a special report from Aaron Dykes. The world is overarmed and peace is underfunded. I have dedicated my life to persuading other young people to give up 
their arms. Aaron Dykes here with a special warning. The gun grabbers of this country and at the United Nations are moving right now to try to do an end run around our Second Amendment. Through the United Nations Arms Trade Treaty, they're attempting to set up international regulations for the trade of small arms and conventional weapons. It is ambitious but achievable, so says Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. I sincerely hope that the member states will agree to a legally binding treaty regulating this arms trade. This is a sneak attack on the Second Amendment, just as Obama told the Brady administration he would unleash. This is an attempt to use international regulations to put more bureaucratic red tape and other controls over the United States. Larry Bell warns in his Forbes column that it could enact tougher licensing requirements, create bureaucratic red tape for firearms ownership, could lead to confiscation and the destruction of quote unauthorized civilian firearms could lead to the return of the ban of the trade, sell, and ownership of semi-automatic weapons, and further could give power to the International Gun Registry, which has already been partially set up through the United Nations. Worst, it undermines our overall national sovereignty, ceding even more power to the United Nations, of which we've already given much away, too much. Now, if it is signed, it would have to be ratified by the U.S. Senate two-thirds of the Senate, and that's a major obstacle, particularly considering that any legislation to control firearms is explicitly unconstitutional. After all, we Americans do have the right to keep and bear arms. It's important to note that a year ago, Senator Jerry Moran of Kansas and 57 other senators signed a letter sent it to Obama telling him not to pursue any United Nations treaty that would affect our civilian ownership of firearms. And earlier this year, more than 120 members of the House issued a similar letter to Obama warning him not to violate our essential Second Amendment rights. But it's the fact that this United Nations treaty will use ambiguous language and easily interpretable language that makes it so dangerous. Number one, the Senate may not recognize the implications it has on domestic firearms ownership because it's worded in international language. And secondly, this treaty may be able to be ramped up over time like so many other international agreements. Just like all other aspects of our sovereignty, international globalists conspiring to change our way of life and create a new system they control have always recognized that a direct frontal assault on the United States Constitution is likely to fail because Americans have been on guard and because at least some in this country remain educated about our founding and about our important way of life. That is the very reason why they've set up the global government systems to do an end run around sovereignty. So many agreements, GATT, the WTO, NAFTA, the SPP, and other international agreements, either bilaterally or multilaterally, binding other countries together, work gradually. They work outside of the constitutional restrictions, but draw in the net around our country and around other free peoples. In reality, it's a double standard, hypocritically allowing the national security shadow operations to continue spread conflict around the world in the name of achieving global governments and what they have always claimed that the United Nations would be, complete and general disarmament. The United Nations has always been incompatible with the United States, its constitution, and its way of life. It was set up to strangle sovereignty and merge nations into the one world government, where among other things, the right to bear arms is not recognized. The United Nations has always been for a complete and general disarmament, not only of nations, but of its peoples. The Atomic Age was born. By 1957, the International Atomic Energy Agency had been formed and the premise of disarmament was sold to the public on the premise that atomic weapons had become far too dangerous and that it was time to embrace, quote, one world or none. All men of goodwill earnestly hope that a realistic control of atomic weapons can and will be achieved. And while the prospect of a nuclear holocaust is certainly chilling, the actual mechanism of disarmament has completely eroded away sovereignty. 
burst at the nation state level by undermining the right to self-defense and declare war and has sadly progressed to undermining individual rights, including that to keep and bear arms under the United States Constitution. In 1959 and 1960, the United States took part in the United Nations Ten Nation Committee on Disarmament. It took on issues of international nuclear, chemical, and biological weapons. While it wouldn't last, it would lead to the formation inside the United States of the Arms Control and Disarmament Agency under the 1961 Arms Control and Disarmament Act. The legislation had been pushed for by the Skull and Bones globalist John J. McCloy. It too promised not to interfere with, restrict, or prohibit the acquisition, possession, or use of firearms by individuals. And yet, it was a long road and a tangled web. By 1963, the United Nations would achieve its partial test ban treaty. By 1968, the United States would fully enter into gun control legislation passing the Omnibus Crime Control and Safe Streets Act and later the Gun Control Act of 1968 modeled by Senator Dodd on Nazi Germany's gun control legislation from 1938. The United Nations will continue its disarmament track, setting up in 1969 the Conference on the Committee on Disarmament, which would later form the more permanent body, the Conference on Disarmament, set up in 1979. In 1972, it would pass a Biological Weapons Convention. As you know, the genesis of this treaty uh, goes back a long time, for two decades. Uh, people have been campaigning on this issue. The United Nations was no longer content simply trying to disarm weapons of mass destruction. By the 80s and 90s, the United Nations began to take on conventional weapons. And in 1990, that included a treaty on conventional armed forces in Europe, followed by the beginnings of a register of conventional arms. Now, by 1993, Bill Clinton had passed the assault weapons ban inside the United States that would last 10 years. This weapon can be extended to include up to 60 to 9 rounds. The next year, in 1995, Bill Clinton turned towards international gun control. Clinton would speak at the 50th anniversary of the United Nations, using the platform to beat the drums to go after conventional and small arms as well, telling them they should turn their swords into plowshares and hope for world peace. We must work on conventional weapons from crime syndicates and drug cartels. Each barrier to justice brought down, each sword turned into a plowshare. That same year, Clinton would urge the United Nations to begin a study on small arms on December 1995. That report would be published two years later and would discuss openly in the header the complete and general disarmament of small arms weaponry. From that time forward, the United Nations would pass literally dozens of treaties and agreements, many of them dealing just in Africa, but all of them dealing with small arms, conventional weapons, parts for firearms, and even ammunition. The 2001 South African Development Community Protocol would not only take on so-called illicit trade of firearms, but would begin to curtail small arms ownership as well, creating a legal basis to deal with both legal and illegal firearms in South Africa. And by 2005, there'd be an international tracing instrument set up and adopted generally at the United Nations level. From Bill Clinton in the 90s to President Calderon in Mexico in the years 2010 and 2009 to Hillary Clinton and Obama of the current administration, they have all blamed the, quote, illegal flow of weapons south as a tool to try to rein in the Second Amendment and create greater restrictions. The, I have never favored uh, all-out uh, ban on handguns. And just really brainwash people into thinking about guns in a vastly different way. Try as hard as we can to keep guns away from people who shouldn't have them. Looking to Fast and Furious, we could see how talking points about stopping the illegal flow of weapons, keeping weapons from getting in the hands of drug cartels and other violent non-state actors, plays into the United Nations' larger attempt 
to rein in guns. Now, the United Nations knows they cannot directly target the United States' domestic ownership of firearms because of the Second Amendment. And so the Fast and Furious documents have shown how the Obama administration, Eric Holder's attorney general, and other people inside the ATF and related organizations all deliberately put guns into the hands of drug cartels in order to demonize the Second Amendment and put more bureaucratic red tape around arms dealers in the Southwest and redeploying 100 personnel to the southwest border in the next 45 days to fortify its Project Gunrunner, which is aimed at disrupting arms trafficking between the United States and Mexico, working with the Mexicans specifically to facilitate gun tracing uh, activity which targets uh, the illegal weapons uh, and their sources in the United States. We saw that directly with the new policy at the ATF telling the four southwestern border states, Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, and California, that they would now have to do extra paperwork and report directly to the FBI whenever someone bought more than two semi-automatic weapons. Now, here at the present 2012 United Nations Arms Trade Treaty, we further see the Mexican delegation telling the other representatives of the world that the Second Amendment is no excuse for not having, quote, product controls on products traded across borders. That's using international bureaucratic legal lawyer speak to try to attack the Second Amendment covertly. The erosion of our Second Amendment is not going to happen overnight, but it is going to happen incrementally through different agreements over the decades, gradually drawing in the net. That's really what we have to watch out for here. And because the United Nations Treaty will explicitly say it doesn't go after the U.S. and other domestic nations' right to have arms, it will appear as though it's not infringing on that right. But nothing could be further from the truth. We must always be vigilant, always be on guard, and always say no to gun control, because that is submission to slavery. I'm Aaron Dykes for the InfoWars Nightly News. Have you been to InfoWarsShop.com lately? Express your inner patriot with these brand new InfoWars t-shirts. Say it loud with the InfoWars Bullhorn shirt. Or educate the sheeple with the Bill of Rights shirt. Grope the public's mind with the TSA shirt. And with this shirt, you can let the dark side know of the Rebel Alliance's power. All available at InfoWarsShop.com sick of the globalist eugenicist control freaks adding poison to your water and laughing as you get sick and die? Start purifying your water with ProPure. My friends, I've done a lot of research and the best gravity filter out there bar none is ProPure and it's available discounted at InfoWars.com. Its filters are silver impregnated to prevent bacterial growth. There's no priming required. It's NSF 42 certified. Optional fluoride filters can reduce fluoride up to 95%. Easy to set up and use. Doesn't require electricity. Purify water from lakes, streams, ponds, and wells. This filter system leaves in beneficial minerals, which is key. Save money by not buying bottled water and avoid BPA that leaches from the plastic. ProPure is the best gravity-fed filter out there. It's what my family uses. Infowars.com already has the lowest price on ProPure. But if you add the promo code WATER at checkout, you get an additional 10% off at Infowars.com. You can also call to order 888-253-3139. And we are back. Thank you for joining us. This is the InfoWars Nightly News. Once again, I'm your host, Darren McBreen. And coming up next, we're going to take a look at an interview I had just a couple of months ago with Ed Haslam. He is the author of Dr. Mary's Monkey, How the Unsolved Murder of a Doctor, a Secret Laboratory in New Orleans, and Cancer-Causing Monkey Viruses are linked to Lee Harvey Oswald, the JFK assassination, and emerging global epidemics.
Now, this was an in-studio interview that we're about to premiere for the first time right here on our program, and it sheds light on a fascinating angle of the JFK assassination that links accused patsy Lee Harvey Oswald with covert cancer research conducted by the CIA, an attempt to basically weaponize the disease and kill Fidel Castro. At least that's their excuse for the dangerous and careless program that they conducted. Now, all of this takes place behind the scenes in New Orleans in the early 1960s. There's a cast of characters that includes, well, Oswald's mistress, Judy Very Baker, co-conspirator David Ferry, who first met Oswald in the Civil Air Patrol, and Dr. Mary Sherman. She is the physician, or was the physician at the Oshner Clinic, who was murdered in 1964 in a hidden laboratory in New Orleans. And I also want to mention an important reference video that coincides with the interview that you're about to see. Alex Jones originally interviewed Ed Haslam on the radio show, and much of what is not covered in this segment well, it can be seen on the Alex Jones radio show interview. Just search for the title, Weaponized Cancer Viruses Exposed, and I guess you can call it part one of a two-part interview with the author. Did inoculating millions of trusted school children with polio vaccines contaminated by monkey viruses trigger an epidemic of soft tissue cancers? Now, what you're about to learn is that what happened back in the early 1960s affects our world tremendously today. An interview with Ed Haslam on the InfoWars Nightly News. Well, the first point is the book is ultimately a cold case investigation into the murder of Dr. Mary Sherman. Yeah. And that's what my initial focus was, and I really had no intention of going into the JFK thing. I, in fact, would have preferred to stay away from it, but that's where the story leads. I went to the library and I got the homicide report, the precinct report, the autopsy report, and all of the newspaper articles for the next two weeks in, involving it, okay? So that is the core set of documents that I present in this book. And when we analyze those documents, you'll see what's wrong with the picture of Mary Sherman's murder. The Metropolitan Crime Commission is very interestingly connected to this because the guy that um, was Judy's boss in this Me and Lee book, he becomes the executive director of the Metropolitan Crime Commission. And the Metropolitan Crime Commission is a faux government, uh, it's got an official sounding name, right? Um, <laughs> like something out of Batman, you know? Mm -hmm. But it's actually a private organization that um, gives themselves uh, some sort of stature in the community by worrying about crime. And um, turns out that Alton Oshner, who is a major character in my book, he had been president of the American Cancer Society and mm -hmm. sat on the board with uh, CIA founder Walt Bill Donovan. Uh, and um, he is the guy that orchestrates the um, television and radio coverage of Lee Harvey, Harvey Oswald in New Orleans. <laughs> I mean, Oshner is a big player, and he's the one that brings Judy into New Orleans for this bioweapons program. And he's on the board of the Metropolitan Crime Commission. What about his connections to David Ferry? What, do we have proof that you know, Oshner and Ferry work together? Well, we, we do have um, Judy's statement, okay? Sure. okay? Now, she is brought to New Orleans at the invitation of Oshner. When she gets there, Oshner's out of town. Mm -hmm. They send in an ex-marine to get a hold of her because she's there early and they don't want a loose cannon around the deck and this sure. ex-marine is Lee Oswald. Within 24 hours, Lee Oswald introduces her to David Ferry and when it comes time to, and 
Lee takes Judy over to Ferry's apartment, and when it's time for Judy to meet with Oshner when he's back in town, it is Lee that sets up the meeting. Sure. So right. Lee Oswald is in the middle of this whole thing as a um, coordinator and a logistical support person. I mean, for example, at one point, Judy needs some more fetal calf serum. Um, for her cancer experiments. Mm -hmm. Well, they don't want her going over to the medical supply place getting that. They send Lee over. And so Lee is running equipment and supplies and people around this string of laboratories that's set up in uptown New Orleans. Now, did he, it's my guess that Lee pretended to meet her uh, on accident, but he was probably sent to meet her because the story is that uh, she dropped a book outside of the post office and he was kind enough to bend down and pick it up, and they, they engaged the conversation. They went on for a nice leisurely walk, you know, in, in New Orleans. Uh, and he charmed of, her with well, his intelligent her, yeah, conversation exactly, exactly. and all that. Just uh, by coincidence. Yeah. Well, I, I don't think there's any chance that it was accidental. Sure. I mean, because if it's accidental, you have to explain how he winds up introducing her to David Ferry in 24 hours. Yeah. And then in another 24 hours, there's a party at David Ferry's apartment at which Mary Sherman attends. Mm -hmm. And then... He coordinates the whole thing with Oshner, and it's Oshner that's brought her in there in the first place. Yeah. I mean, if that's an accident, you know, I got some swamp land I want to talk to you about. Uh, Jim, why are these books, Dr. Mary's Monkey and Me and Lee, so important? Oh, well, that's an easy one, Alex. Uh, number one, <clears throat> once you understand about the adulteration of the, uh, of the polio vaccine back in the 50s, uh, then you'll begin to understand why there's been such an upsurge in the cancer rate. So this is a story that affects millions of people. I mean, this actually impacts the public, all right? Not some celebrity news that who cares except the people involved. Uh, and the second thing is it also rips open the, uh, the incredible tangled and darkly woven tapestry behind the Kennedy assassination and shows you the interconnections between CIA and FBI intelligence agencies, the military, secret laboratory, secret biochemical warfare testing, uh, the war against Castro, and what role Lee Harvey Oswald played in all this. Uh, he was not just some lone schnook off the street. Uh, and if you'll read Ed's two books, uh, Dr. Mary's Monkey and uh, Me and Lee, uh, you will uh, find out not only what Lee Harvey Oswald was actually up to when he was in New Orleans in the summer of 1963, but how he connects into this matrix of powerful and violent groups that were behind the Kennedy assassination. The first thing to realize is where New Orleans is. I mean, New Orleans is at the mouth of the Mississippi River, and trade is the major business. So trade with Latin America um, is the major component of that. And so in the 50s, there was a lot of trade with Cuba. Okay, so the moment the embargo happens, New Orleans loses 25% of its business. And then Castro and Shea are talking about taking the revolution to South America. Okay. Well, if they do that, there go the coffee beans and there go the bananas, mm -hmm. okay? So there's a lot of economic pressure, and Oshner's in the middle of this. I mean, if you look at Oshner's hospital, he's got all these flagpoles out front, and there's Guatemala, Honduras, you know? He's got the whole thing down to Argentina, yeah. okay? Because w the business model, the premise of his entire um, uh, hospital is he's going to supply medical services to the oligarchy of Latin America. Okay, well, if you overthrow the oligarchy, there goes his business. Okay, so all these people in New Orleans, from the coffee barons to the banana people to the medical people, all have a common economic interest, which Castro is threatening. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's sort of the first point. The second point is in 1962, October of 1962, we have the Cuban Missile Crisis. Now, actually, those missiles were in there earlier, but it wasn't a public issue yeah. until 62, all right? And in 62, we're sitting there in New Orleans looking at this big circle, and there's New Orleans, and here are the missiles, and it's 40 minutes away from us, okay? 
And so, you know, we're wondering, you know, if, if we're going to die before dinner, you know, I mean, basically um, there. And New Orleans took this threat of Soviet missiles uh, very personally. And uh, because uh, we were the ones that were visualizing our city in flames. OK. Mm -hmm. And so it was at that point in time that they took a project that they had previously been doing uh, and turned it into a bioweapon project, okay? Now this other project starts with the contamination of the polio vaccine in the 1950s. And what happens is after they release 100 million doses of the polio vaccine, which has been grown on monkey kidney cells, mm -hmm. they realize that one of the dozens of monkey viruses that they knew were in the vaccine actually causes cancer. So this is like the biggest mistake in history. I mean, they have mass inoculated the American population, particularly the children, with a cancer-causing virus. And therefore, the logical conclusion of that is we have a epidemic of cancer on the horizon. This is absolute fact. And the magnitude of it in suffering, if you've ever watched a family member, you know, wheezing and battling for breath in their deathbed, dying of cancer. And you know that depending on the cancers, they're up thousands of percentile. And the government tries to cook the numbers, keep it quiet, kind of like unemployment numbers. It's exponential. The United States leads the world in illness, in cancer. What we see is a massive eruption of soft tissue cancers happens right after uh, the polio vaccine. But in the, the, the real-time experience of it from the players involved, they realized this in 1958. And they stamp it secret because they don't want to be held accountable for it. And then they get really busy trying to make a uh, vaccine. And in the polio vaccine, they had three flavors of polio to work with. I'll call them heavy, medium, and light. Okay. Right. In this SV40, which is the uh, cancer-causing monkey viruses, they have one flavor and it's heavy. Okay, and what they want to do is try to get this thing to mutate into a benign form that they can, or a less strong form that they can use as a vaccine, hopefully to prevent the epidemic of cancer. And this is like a, nobody wants to admit they're doing this research because they don't want to explain why they're doing the research. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is set up as a medical Manhattan project. The world will never know the true facts of what occurred my motives for people that have, have so much to gain and, and have such a material motive for putting me in a position I'm in. We'll never let the true facts come above board to the, to the world. Now these people are in very high positions, yeah? Yes. Okay, it's also been claimed that uh, Jack Ruby died of cancer. You want to get into that a little bit? Well, that claim was made very early um, in 1967, shortly after uh, Ruby died. Mm -hmm. And what we now know is uh, several things that are really important about that. First of all, the biological weapon that um, Judy and Lee were working on took 28 days to work. Okay. okay. And Which was about the time it took him to develop cancer and, and die. It, that's right. right. Yeah. It was 28 days from the day Jack Ruby was diagnosed yeah. with cancer to the day he died. Okay, so that's point one. We got a time match there. Mm -hmm. Secondly, Jack Ruby passed a note to his guard that said, they have injected me with cancer. Okay, so we had Jack Ruby saying it. All right. Mm -hmm. Thirdly, turns out that Jack Ruby is part of the money financing for this bioweapons lab, and he's bagmanning money from Dallas down to um, New Orleans for this project, and they explain the whole project to him, all right? So he's there in David Ferry's apartment uh, with Judy and Lee, so he knows that they have a biological weapon capable of killing people in this manner. Then there's a, um, a very fine um, Chinese-American doctor um, who was taking care of Jack Ruby, and then one day they told him his services were no longer available. The last time he saw Jack Ruby, he um, was fine, okay? And then about six weeks later, Jack Ruby's dead, okay? Marduk is his name, M-A-R-D-U-C-K. 
they then bring in somebody from, quote, out of town who actually has no real credentials except as a psychiatrist, but he's got a lot of contacts with the CIA. And it is him, his name is Jolie West, or, or sometimes called Jolly West, okay. um, who is suspected of being the person who actually injects Jack Ruby uh, with the uh, cancer uh, weapon. And what's really interesting to me, I was discussing this with Jim Mars um, on the phone one night, and Jim said that when he was teaching his course on JFK, he had somebody come and take the course who actually operated a uh, electron microscope and had examined the cancer cells from Jack Ruby. And there's sort of this type of cell and that type of cell, and they are never together. And he found, because they come from different organs in the yeah, body, yeah. and he found both of these cells in Jack R Ruby's tumor, suggesting that it's all was mixed up in a, in a cancer cocktail, just like they were doing. Sure. And part of that is um, the lung cancer cells were found in his liver or whatever it was, you know. And so there is, from a, a, a real scientific forensic point of view, there is evidence that says uh, Ruby was probably killed with cancer. And of course, the timing of it was uh, perfect because he couldn't, couldn't talk. Sure. So it, that says the, uh, one of the uh, uses of the biological weapon is to dispose of witnesses while they're awaiting trial in jail. Well, I noticed in the book, Me and Lee, that mm -hmm. you referenced um, Oswald's time cards. Now, can you tell us about the significance of all that? Okay. Well, one of the things that is very uh, conspicuous about the Warren Commission volumes is they included all kind of information that didn't have anything to do with the real issue, mm -hmm. like the dental records of Jack Ruby's mother is, okay. is the great example on that. That was fascinating reading. <laughs> Just kidding. But one of the things they did not include was the time cards, Lee Harvey Oswald's time cards from the Riley Coffee Company. Mm -hmm. Now, this is um, a pretty conspicuous omission, and when the JFK Records Act came through and we got into the deeper files, we found that they had, the FBI had collected those from the Riley Coffee Company and had turned them over to the Warren Commission. So someone in the Warren Commission said, we don't want these things in the Warren Commission volumes, even though we have them as evidence. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting about that is when you read the Warren Commission, they interview Oswald's supervisor. And he says, oh, he was this horrible employee. I could never find him. He was off campus when he's clocked in and, and all this stuff. I mean, you, you read that and you say, okay, you're a supervisor. Why were you approving his time cards? Sure. If you yeah. thought he was cheating the company, okay? <laughs> well, the point is, the supervisor was not approving his time cards. Mm -hmm. The person that was responsible for approving Lee Oswald's time cards was William Moynihan, who was Judy's boss. And when he wasn't around, Judy signed for him. So she actually signed Lee Harvey Oswald's time cards on occasion. Right, and her initials are on there, and we compare these initials on the time cards with other documents like her um, college ID and uh, things that she wrote at the time, and you can see it's her initials. So that's why, so if that were to be allowed in the Warren Commission... The uh, logical question any investigator would have asked is whose who is? initials is that? Yeah. Okay, and that's what they didn't want to do. They didn't want to get into who is Judy Very Baker and why was she in New Orleans because that leads you to the underground medical laboratory and the biological weapon. Wow. You know, when Ed Haslam began to investigate the cold case file on Dr. Mary Sherman, he never imagined that it would connect some of the most prominent people in New Orleans to Lee Harvey Oswald or the mafia or the dark forces deep within the United States government. But that's exactly where this investigation leads, and then some. After all, this book is not just about the murder of John F. Kennedy. The story ultimately leads to something that affects all of us, and that is the cancer epidemic. And just like historian and investigative journalist Jim Mars noted in the video you just watched, this book will change your whole perspective on what really went down in Dallas 
and the murder of John Fitzgerald Kennedy. I guess you can say that Dr. Mary's monkey is the missing link in the JFK assassination. That's going to do it for tonight's program. We hope you enjoyed the show. The InfoWars Nightly News will return next Monday through Friday, 7 o'clock p.m. Central Time. Until then, hope you all have a blessed weekend. We'll see you back right here on Monday. Good night.